We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. What is the most important relationship skill? It's a good question. When I was asked, I came up with a whole host of answers, but not the answer of my witness today. The most important relationship skill, in her opinion, is being able to balance the need for individuality and the need for togetherness. It turns up as a question often unspoken in my therapy room, do I have to give up being me to be loved by you? Juliet Grayson is a psychotherapist, coach and teacher who specialises in working with couples and with sexual problems. She's the author of Landscapes of the Heart, The Working World of a Sex and Relationship Therapist. The therapeutic term for this is self-deferentiation. What is it exactly and why is it so important for a healthy relationship? Well, differentiation is the ability to balance two fundamental desires that humans have, two fundamental drives. There's the desire to be an individual and direct the course of our own life. And there's a desire for attachment and connection. So if you like, it's the me and the we. It's how can I be an individual and be together with you? You know, in a way, this has been a lifelong journey for me. And it sounds quite simple when we talk about it, but I find it difficult to do. Increasingly easy as I, as I practice more and more, but, but nevertheless, sometimes it's really difficult to do. How do you maintain your sense of yourself when you're emotionally or physically close to others, or you're at a big distance from others. Sometimes that's really hard. How, how do I keep my sense of myself? And the other thing that's interesting is when people become more important to you, sometimes that can be harder. And that's a bit weird because you think, well, as they become more important to me, it gets easier. But we hear about people who, or you may even have had this experience where you find yourself telling your life story to someone on a plane who's sitting next to you on a plane, but you can't go home and talk to your husband or your wife. And it's because the opinion of your husband or your wife matters so much to you that you daren't be honest with them. And I guess that's the fundamental of it for me, is it's how clear, open, transparent and honest can I be with my partner. And if I'm dependent on them for my emotional stability, which we call emotional fusion, when you need the other person to keep your own self balanced, emotionally balanced. If I'm dependent on, my husband's called William, if I'm dependent on William for my emotional balance, then I'm not going to tell him things that I think are going to be difficult for him to hear, things that he disagrees with. Whereas if I can self-soothe, if I can take responsibility for maintaining my own emotional balance, then I'm able to be open and honest, and we don't have those blocks in the way between us. So there's a a straightforwardness that can happen in our relationship, a transparency that is just really liberating and lovely and clean. Now, you said you've had your own personal struggles with this, and I think everybody does. Perhaps you can illuminate it a bit by sort of sharing a bit of your own experience about how to balance me and we. So I grew up in a family where Definitely, we were emotionally fused as a family. So my father was the controlling person in that, and he would control by his mood. So he didn't get angry explicitly. Anger in our family wasn't allowed, but he would sulk. So if anyone did something that he didn't like, we all knew it, and we would all tiptoe around. So he was definitely managing the family dynamic. And what he was managing was his own anxiety. So he was managing his own anxiety, which he wasn't very good at managing, by keeping all of us relatively controlled or stifled or contained so that we didn't rock his boat, as it were. And so when you did rock his boat, how did it feel inside to you? Oh, horrible. Yucky, yucky, yucky. You know, it's like, because there would be a withdrawal of love. 
That was the way he controlled. There would be a, a disconnection and a withdrawal. And I now realize, and I've only realized this in the relatively recent, maybe four years ago or something, that that disconnection of love triggers shame. So shame is keeping the interconnection, keeping the bridge between two people, the interpersonal bridge alive and connected. So when that's disconnected, it causes shame. I didn't know until very recently that I was living as a child in a world of complete and utter toxic shame most of the time. And that's very linked to the emotional fusion. And that's extraordinary, really, when you think about it, because you've spent a lifetime looking at relationships and thinking about relationships, and it's taken you that long to to realise that. Absolutely. And I live with a man, you know, one of the very early conversations William and I had 20 odd years ago, 25 years ago, was how toxic shame is endemic and causes problems for so many people in the world. And I kind of went, yeah, 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 and didn't really get it. Now, my reaction to shame, people have various reactions to shame. One of my reactions to shame is to blame. So when I feel ashamed of something, I go into blaming the other person. Some people withdraw, some people go into denial. My core reaction is to blame. So I would say he didn't explain it clearly enough, which of course <laughs> is a blaming, is a blaming thing to do. Anyway, many, many years into our relationship, I began to realize that shyness and embarrassment were in the same kind of ballpark of shame. So that was the beginning of the unlocking. But it wasn't until William and I started to do talks on shame. We, we were asked to do a talk on shame and compassion. So I thought, okay, well, I'll do compassion and he can do shame. Don't really know what shame is. And I started to research it and I suddenly went, oh my God, this is terrifying because I'm a psychotherapist. I've been working with people for decades. I've worked with many clients in shame and really not really known what it was or realized the impact of it. So William and I then went on and did 13 talks on shame. So I feel like I have a good grasp of it now and uh, really recognize where it's played a part in my own life. And I see the toxic shame and the emotional fusion as being very interconnected. And the way out of that is differentiation. Yes, which is why it's so important. Well, thank you very much for sharing that, because I think sometimes people think that if you're a therapist, you've got yourself all sorted, whereas really, I love the, the quote of Terry Real, who's an American uh, psychotherapist, who says, therapists are people who need to be in therapy so much they've turned it into a profession. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look in detail at a fused couple in a way that people might actually recognise if they are fused or not. So one of the things that I think happens in a fused couple is that the anxiety is infectious. I remember a couple who came to see me. She had rung me. He had had an affair. She wanted to know all the details of the affair. That was basically what she was asking me as the therapist to do. And we were at a place, my room, my therapy room has three individual chairs, but I was seeing them somewhere else and they were sitting on a sofa. And I remember that every time she held his hand and every time I asked him a specifying question about what had happened, she would stroke his hand. So it was like she was stroking his anxiety and calming him down because she couldn't cope with her own anxiety at his anxiety at being asked difficult questions. So one of the signs of fusion is that it's like your emotional Siamese twins. You find it hard to soothe yourself and you either fit in when you don't want to, or you stubbornly take the opposite view. Both of those are signs of fusion. I don't understand the taking the opposite view obstinately, how that is a sign of fusion. Well, it's, I'm so influenced by you that I can't let you have your view and me have my view and just be relaxed and okay with that. Uh -huh. I have to, I have to defend myself against you because I'm emotionally fused and I can't bear how emotionally fused I am. Does that make more sense? Yep. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of couples who come in saying they want more communication are actually fused. And it's not that they want more communication. It's that they can't bear to hear what the other one is saying, or when they get the communication, they don't like it. So I, I, I had a, a, a client, well, actually, this was someone who was working in my office. So she said to her son, I want you to be honest. This was her son from her first marriage. She found it difficult. He looked like his father. She didn't like his father anymore. So there were, there were difficulties there. But she loved him. He was her son. He was 18. 
And he rang her up and told her that he had got drunk the night before. And I was in the office with her and I heard her shouting down the phone at him, how dare you do that? You shouldn't do that. La, 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 la. And I thought to myself, you've asked him to be honest. And when he's honest, you shout at him. And what you're teaching him is not to be honest. It's amazing how often you see that, that couples come and say, I want you to tell me the truth. I want you to open up to me. And then when they do, it's too painful to actually be able to deal with. Absolutely. And and I think that's a really important thing to kind of help people be aware. If they're going to ask for the information, they have to be able to be robust enough to handle the information that comes out, whatever it is. Sometimes it's better for them not to ask for the information because they're not robust enough to be able to hold that knowledge. And it's not that you've got to agree with it. You haven't got to say it's okay to get drunk, but you have to be able to listen and hear the other person long enough for them to actually feel that they've been heard and that what they've done isn't the end of the world. You can later obviously have a discussion about alcohol, et cetera, et cetera, and is it a good idea? But that's very different from immediately shouting at somebody. Exactly. Exactly. If you go straight into a rant, if you go straight into telling them that they're wrong, basically we're back to shame. You're disconnecting that interpersonal bridge. You're shaming them and they're more likely to go off and drink in order to manage the bad feelings they have as a result of being shamed than they are to come and say, tell me more about what you really think. You know, it's, 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 they're not going to come back for more. We teach people how to treat us. One of my clients said that to me years ago. We teach people how to treat us. It's so true. That mother was teaching that son not to be honest with her. And that, I think, is a really important thing for us to take on board. Yes, because there often is a huge silence between mothers and their grown-up sons because sons do things that (laughs) mothers don't like. And instead of actually being able to discuss these things, we get into silence. And you sort of then get to the other extreme. We've done the fused couples and then you have the cut-off couples. Tell me about them. Yeah, so in my book, I created a model. It's a very simplistic model, but I created four characters. The pleaser, the boss, the loner, and the self-developer. So the pleaser, the boss, and the loner are all fused and enmeshed and the self-developer is the differentiated one so that's the healthy option so the cut-off one the the loner is an avoidant person the way they handle too much enmeshment sometimes they look like they're more differentiated because they're handling themselves and they're not requiring closeness but actually they're not differentiated they are having to cut off because the power of the other person is too much for them to handle So the cutoff is because of the power of the enmeshment. Yes, I I must admit, this is my confession time. There used to be a a period, I mean, I've got past this now, but, you know, that I liked closeness, but only so much, you know. So actually, if I was on holiday with somebody, you know, I sort of needed to have, you know, an evening or something where I went off on my own just to sort of decompress a little bit. And I did have a period where I was in a long distance relationship where I lived in one country and he lived in another country. And that way we, (laughs) in one way, we had the best of both worlds as far as I saw it in those days, because we had togetherness, but you sort of knew it was only going to be for a certain amount of time and then have separation. So, you know, and I would have said I wanted this relationship, but somehow I had arranged it so that actually we lived in different countries. Yes. Again, it's, it's great to hear you say that because it helps people to understand the sort of dynamic of how this works. And you can be cut off in the same house, can't you? You don't necessarily have to be living in two different countries. How would cut off in the same house look like? Well, it would look like being emotionally so self-contained. So let me come back to the definition of differentiation. The definition of differentiation is the ability to connect and have emotional connection and the ability to be who you are and be autonomous. So if you're at one end of the spectrum, then you're cut off. So there's lack of emotional connection. There's nothing wrong in a very healthy relationship with negotiating. One night a week, I'd like to go off on my own and have my space and time. Nothing wrong with that at all. That's a really healthy thing to do. But when you're disconnecting without it being agreed with the other or without any negotiation or or from a place of not being able to hold the closeness anymore, 
that's when we're in that emotional cutoff. I mean, probably Andrew, you can talk more about this than I can because my my favorite place is the pleaser. You know, I'm the compliant, accommodating, soothing one that will make everything okay. So I can talk to you a lot about that because I know that from the inside out. So how would you answer that question? What would it look like to be cut off and in the same house? Well, I can also do pleasing very well as well. I, I'm <laughs> multitasking here. I'm, this is such a long time ago, but I can illustrate it more from clients. I think it's often when they get cut off, and what is particularly distressing is when there's been a row and the person refuses to talk about it for not an hour or so while you calm down, but Sometimes they're still not talking about it two weeks later. And you think, my God, that's an awful long time to hold that row so centrally. And and yes, you know, they will answer questions like, would you like another cup of tea? But they're not actually really talking. And sometimes they never actually solve the argument. They just sort of, after two weeks, they sort of get fed up with it and have a sort of truce. Yes. And I was thinking about clients who also spend years not really talking about it and not getting back to a truce either, but there's a little kind of quiet resentment that just lives between them and that kind of wall that sits between them that can be felt. And the person who's kind of, if you like, more responsible for creating that wall may be able to say to themselves, well, I'm being perfectly reasonable. I'm making cups of tea. I'm coming to bed with you. But in the voice tone, you can hear the tension, the anxiety, the suppressed anger is all there. And there's not a a softness and an openness and a communication. And so can you have one partner who wants to be fused and the other partner that wants to be cut off? So you get a sort of demand withdrawal sort of kind of dynamic. Well, as a couple therapist, you know, that's very common to see that. And the other common dynamic is the one that wants to stifle and control the boss. The boss is a controlling, dominating, stifling, again, in order to manage how they feel. So a very common dynamic is the please a boss dynamic, where you get one who's compliant and the other one who's controlling. And it's a a dance that just carries on and on and on. And I'm only being controlling for your own good or the good of the relationship or because I've researched this on the internet and all the experts agree that children should go to bed at seven o'clock. Absolutely. And you're not giving your partner space for their perception and their intuition as a parent and all of that. One person is declaring this is how it has to be. And there's a lack of negotiation. You know, one of the really important skills for relationships is to be able to negotiate. So we've, we've looked at people that don't have self-differentiation. Let's sort of look at the other side and define what would a differentiated couple look like? I think when you're differentiated, you're able to hold the ability to be close. So you keep the communication open, that emotional connection is there, and you're able to hold your own needs and you're able to respect your partner's needs. So there's a chap, Robert Johnson, who says spiritual maturity is the ability to hold paradox. And I think that that ability to hold the paradox of the me and the we, of my needs and our needs, is a really crucial thing. I need to be able to self-soothe. That's one of the key skills for couples who are differentiated to be able, when you find yourself getting triggered or activated by your partner, (sighs) breathe. Again, in my book, there's a model, which is the five-pointed star, and the center of the star is breathe. Because in a way, I think that's one of the most important skills that we can have in order to operate from the best in ourselves, that we can learn to take long out-breaths, which soothes the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest part of the nervous system. So self-soothing techniques, breathing out, and in a voice that says he has a right to have this belief or she has a right to do this. It's okay. That's their view. It's not my view. I don't have to persuade them of my view. So self-supporting inner talk that will, again, act as a soothing mechanism to allow the other person to be different. Because sometimes when the other's different, it is really difficult. You know, my husband and I have different ways of complaining. I complain more quickly about things. He doesn't complain very much, but when he gets to the point of complaining, he's like a exocet missile. And I hear him on the phone to someone and frankly, I'm a bit embarrassed by it, you know, because it's not the way you do things in my book. But I've learned I have to let him do it his way. That's his style. 
And in the old days, I would have seen that as a reflection on me and I would have wanted to stop it because it was a reflection on me. Now I don't do that. Now I go, this is a reflection on him. You know, how he treats someone else, that's up to him. It's not my responsibility. Again, like with the example with the mother and the son, you know, I can talk to him about it later, but there's no point in me steaming in here and and rescuing this situation because I'm only going to make it worse. I'm not going to rescue it. You know, and all of those instincts that I might have, I've really learned to step away, self-soothe and let him do it in his way, which sometimes his way is really effective. And I might not like it, but that's, that's fine. You know, that's, that's, it's his responsibility. It's not my responsibility. So you are self-differentiated effectively. In that moment, yes, yes. So I've put together sort of nine questions for our listeners to test whether they have differentiation or not. And as I take each one of them, perhaps you can explain why this is a useful test. So the first question is, do you normally see your partner as the problem? So one of the things I think for a differentiated person that is really important is their ability to self-confront. So when you're feeling challenged in a situation, really important to say, what's my part in this? What's my place in this? How am I contributing to this in an unhelpful way? So rather than putting the emphasis and the onus on the other person and how they're behaving, we're shifting the emphasis and the onus onto ourselves. I think that's a core aspect of being self-differentiated. So number two, do you feel pulled to match your partner's emotional state, such as when they're in anger, crisis or sadness? So again, that's about the emotional fusion and being the person who feels like you have to keep your partner calm if they're in anger or crisis. You know, there's nothing wrong. It's lovely to reach out to your partner when they're struggling. Nothing wrong with that at all. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't connect with one another, but I'm not responsible for my partner's feelings. So if my partner is struggling, I can be empathic, I can be there, I can be accommodating up to a certain point that feels really comfortable for me. But the responsibility for how they feel is their responsibility. It's not my responsibility. And I sometimes get couples where one is depressed and the other is frightened that somehow they're going to catch the depression, that it's going mm-hmm. to sort of seep into to them. And that, obviously, if you think your partner's depression is going to make you depressed, that is suggesting that you're not going to be very self-differentiated, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it's that Siamese twins of anxiety, you know, that, that you get infected by the other one. Absolutely. Number three, do you conceal how you really feel about things? Mm. So we talked about this a little earlier, the importance of being able to be honest. And I think the client that epitomized this for me was the woman who confessed to me that when they'd met 20 years before, they'd already got kind of into the relationship and they hadn't yet got married, but they were, you know, committed to one another. And her partner said something about, I couldn't ever live with a conservative voter. And she had been voting conservative for her whole life and continued to do so for the next 20 years and confessed to me that she'd voted conservative in every election and never told her partner. And that seems that is- again like a, you know, her fear of that he wouldn't be able to handle it and that he would leave and the consequences were just too much for her. And I think this next one, number four, sort of is the same thing. Do you say what you know others want to hear? Yeah. That's that people-pleasing kind of character. And also, do you do what you think the other wants you to do? Another little phrase that one of my clients gave me, which I love, is a piece of advice. The same client said, take my advice because I don't use it, which I thought was rather fun. <laughs> but, um, but they also said, you know, if you've got new clients who are getting into a relationship, tell them don't do anything in the first 30 days that you're not willing to do for the next 30 years. And I think that's that pleasing thing of, oh, they'll like me if I get up at six o'clock in the morning and drive them to the station, when actually I'm not an early riser and I hate getting up at six o'clock in the morning. You know, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Don't, don't, don't just say the right thing to please them. Don't just do the right thing. Because if you're going to have a good relationship, it needs to be robust enough to handle your differences. 
And sometimes I get couples that recognise that I've been doing what I think you want and they have been doing what the other one wants. And actually, neither of them have wanted to do this. So it's not like we had the boss and the pleaser. We had two pleasers together that were actually not pleasing either of them. Yeah, yeah, that, that happens a lot. And that's very sad. Yeah, yeah. We've already covered this one. Do you talk to your friends about your relationship problems instead of your partner? But that is incredibly common. So, I mean, it's okay to sort of test things out with your friends. And I think women do this quite a lot. Sadly, men don't do it enough. But how much of that discussion is carried over into your personal relationship? Yes. And I think one of the things is, to what extent does that conversation inflate your aggravation against your partner? And what to what extent does it soothe and calm your aggravation about your partner? So are you doing it to inflame yourself and justify and be convinced, yes, I'm right, he's a bully and it's horrible, and which is going to make it more difficult? Or are you doing it to diffuse and name it so that you can let it go? So what's the motivation behind that? Yeah. And sometimes you can actually be doing it to manage something that is sort of unmanageable and really does need to be spoken about as well. Yes. You know, one of my confessions as a couple therapist, there have been a couple of couples over the years where I know I've they've come in and I've sort of diffused and diffused and diffused. And I wonder, you know, whether actually they would have been better separating. And if I hadn't mm. diffused the situation and helped to make it tolerable for them to live with it, because they then did separate maybe three years later or something. Yeah, I've seen that one as well. And when they do separate, it is a wham-bam sort of kind of separation. Whereas maybe it would have been better if, you know, I'm thinking of having the ability to go back in a time machine that Mm -hmm. we'd use the time more to help them self-differentiate and then actually decide whether they wanted to have this relationship or not. So it was sort of a conscious decision rather than, oh, shall we go on, which is sort of almost a autopilot sort of kind of decision, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting one. Do you agree to things you have no interest in doing? Well, I think we've all done that with our partner, haven't we? (laughs) But when does that become a problem? I think it becomes a problem when it's unbalanced. So if one person is always doing the agreeing, you know, if one is always doing the giving and the other is always doing the taking, to phrase it in that way, then that's a problem. If you're occasionally doing things that you don't really want to, but you're willing to, and they're occasionally doing things that they don't really want to and are willing to, then that sounds like a perfectly fine arrangement. The one in my head at the moment is watching TV programs that you quite like, but you don't really like, you know, that kind of thing. That doesn't seem to look like the worst crime, really, does it? It's a sort of nice <laughs> thing to do to to watch Top Gear because they like Top Gear sort <laughs> yes. of kind of thing. Yes. Yes. But then there are limits, you know, for me, I can't, I can't sit and watch hours of football. That's, you know, beyond the pale for me. And, and he can't sit and watch some of the programs I do. So that's fine. You know, there's a few things that we pay attention to separately and that works well. Now, this is one we haven't really covered. Do you demand directly or indirectly compliments and praise? Yes. The needing to be validated by someone else. The place that this work comes from is Murray Bowen, and David Schlarch then kind of took on and, and really spread it through the world. And I feel like I'm going on the back of both of them and spreading it a bit more. Schlarch has a phrase for this, which he called other validation. Do I need the other person to validate me in order for me to feel like I'm worthwhile, as opposed to self-validation? And self-validation is where I go, actually, I'm okay. I'm doing all right. You know, I look all right in this or my hair looks all right like this, whatever it is, you know, that I'm not reliant on the other person to make me feel okay. Because if I am reliant on the other person to make me feel okay, I give them too much power over me. And then when they're not there to do that, or when they don't, or they're not in the right mood to do it, it kind of makes me very easy to be manipulated by their validation or not, you know, withholding or giving. So definitely that a differentiated person is going to be more self-validated than other validated. So this one is a really, really crucial question. Do you seek to control others instead of controlling yourself? That's the essence of the boss. The boss character, who is kind of controlling, dominating and stifling, will, in order to manage their own uncomfortable feelings, will control the people around them. So... If I'm a boss character 
and I see you getting anxious, I have to stop you getting anxious because that makes me anxious and I can't bear that anxiety. So I have to stop you from doing that thing that makes me anxious. And the mad thing is (laughs) that you can't control other people, but you can control yourself. Absolutely. But there are there are so many people who by their hair trigger temper or their jealousy or their emotional insecurity and demanding constant affirmation from other people or their use of drug and alcohol are controlling the people around. It's a kind of emotional bullying. And my final question is, do you concern yourself with the needs of others but disregard your own? Yeah, so that's the pleaser that gives away too much and does too much for others and then usually has resentment about it. Maybe the martyr, you know, has a bit of a martyr complex. And it's really important that we pay attention to ourselves and that we listen to our needs. And it's not always easy to do. And and the again, the negotiation is important here because if I can negotiate with you and say, you want this and I'd like this, and how do we manage that? And so... You know, there are various books on negotiation. The ones that influenced me a lot was Getting to Yes and Getting Past No, which were by Fisher and Yuri, U-R-Y. And they're just really good. They're kind of more business books, really, but they're just really good on helping you get the basics of negotiation. And I've done a podcast on that as well, different negotiation tools. We'll put the details of those books. Is that two books or one book? Two books. Two books, Getting to Yes and Getting Past No. Yeah. So I think we're beginning to show that differentiation doesn't just happen. You have to work on it. So let's imagine that somebody has spotted, hmm, I think I could do with some self-differentiation. I hope you've spotted that you could do with some self-differentiation rather than my partner could do with some (laughs) self-differentiation. So what do you do? So I have a five-pointed star. So it's the five points, the middle of the star is breathe, and the five points are check, compose, clarify, commit, consider. And this is about operating from the best in yourself. So take us through that. Yeah. So the check is, am I operating in the past or the present? So often when I'm triggered, the thing that's triggered me is more to do with my history and something that happened when I was a child than it is to do with the current day. So if I'm having a response that's loaded, that is bigger than I would expect it to be, then I think that's a blast from the past. So one of the checks is, am I in the past or am I in the present? Is this really related to what's happening here and now? Or am I reacting more strongly because of what's happened in my childhood, in which case I need to go back and look at that and realize it's less to do with my partner than I like to think it is. And then the other thing to check is, am I in the pleaser, the loner, the boss, or in that kind of developer place at the moment. So which of those am I coming from? And how can I hold on to my best self? You know, how in this moment can I breathe, self-soothe, and be in my adult self in this relationship? So the next one is compose, and that's about soothing your anxiety, calming your mind, soothing your heart, and staying grounded, staying present kind of in the here and now. And then you have clarify. And that one's about what am I really going for here? What's my goal? And I think a lot of us don't live our lives focused around our goals. You know, if my goal is really to piss my husband off, well, that's fine. I know how to do that very effectively. But if my goal is to get a result that works for both of us, then I might want to approach this in a slightly different way. And how can I dovetail our goals? How can I get what I need, but also give him something in the process? So you know, for example, if I need to use the car, you know, we have one car and I need to use the car. Maybe I can say, I know you wanted to drop that suit off at the dry cleaners. I could drop it in on the way if I've got the car tomorrow, you know, that kind of thing. What's in it for them to give me what I want? And how can I just have that awareness? And also awareness of the consequences of what's going to kind of happen and what I want the consequences to be, both the long and short term consequences of whatever it is that we're doing. Because sometimes in the short term, I'm going to get what I want. But in the long term, I'm really going to actually put a strain on our relationship. So it might not be in the long term consequences. It might not be beneficial for me to be going for this right now. It might be wiser for me to step back and wait for another time or 
shift my goal in some way or listen to him more carefully. So really getting clear about what it is that I want. And then we've got commit. So committing is, I think, probably one of the most important relationship skills. This is about tolerating the discomfort of things not going the way you want, tolerating discomfort of managing your own anxiety when your partner's upset or stressed or whatever it is. So Schnarch has another phrase for it. He uses the phrase meaningful endurance. You know, how can I stay in this? How can I self-confront myself and recognize my part in it? And how can I hang on in there in a way that's going to be useful and beneficial whilst breathing and soothing and doing all of those things that we've already talked about? And then we finish off with consider. So the consider one is about how am I communicating? What are my non-verbals? Is my voice sounding stressed and anxious? Am I, it's commonly known that Morabian did some research on communication and he said that 7% of the communication is the words, 38% is the tone of voice and 55% is the body language. And if I say, oh, darling, you're not going to do that, are you? It's different from I say, oh, darling, you're not going to do that, are you? You know, it's the tone of voice has such a huge impact on the way that the message is received. So becoming more and more conscious of your tone of voice is really important. And if you're shaking your fist at the same time, <laughs> whatever you're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. Or looking or glowering, you know, having a face that's got angry eyes. So, and another thing to consider is what's their perspective. So step into their shoes and think, okay, what are they going for here? What are they feeling here? So the ability to step into different perspectives is wonderful. So we can be in our own shoes, in our own perspective. We can step into their shoes and see it from their perspective, or we can sort of have an observer position where the feelings are less involved. And, you know, you imagine that you're looking at this as if you're on a balcony looking down at Juliet talking to Andrew, for example, and see it from that observer perspective. And being able to move around those different perspectives is very helpful when you're having a tense disagreement or discussion with your partner. And when I was researching this topic, I found this sentence about the differentiated couples when they have a conflict, which I thought was really interesting, which is you're seeking understanding rather than agreement. Mm, yeah, because you don't have to have agreement. That's the whole point. You don't have to like what your partner's doing. It's understanding and being empathic and letting them be who they are and them letting me be who I am. And over time, you probably will get to a place of agreement. But if the agreement is I want to do A and you want to do B, then we're probably going to get stuck. But if we're allowed to go for understanding rather than agreement, we might then finally find a, a C way or a third way. But if you're not differentiated, you're going to be going into I'm right and you're wrong rather than trying to find that third way. Absolutely. There's a poem or a part of a poem by Khalil Gibran, which I really love, which I think really sums this up. He was a Lebanese-American writer in the 1800s. Many of you will have heard of him. And it's on marriage. And he says, but let there be spaces in your togetherness and let the winds of the heavens dance between you. Love one another, but make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the shores of your souls. Fill each other's cup, but drink not from one cup. Give one another of your bread, but eat not from the same loaf. Sing and dance together and be joyous, but let each one of you be alone, even as the strings of a lute are alone, though they quiver with the same music. Give your hearts, but not into each other's keeping, for only the hand of life can contain your hearts, and stand together, yet not too near together, for the pillars of the temple stand apart, and the oak tree and the cypress grow not in each other's shadow. That's beautiful. I particularly love the image of the with the lute, where mm. the strings are separate, but actually they play beautiful music together. I think that yeah. sort of sums up self-differentiation in a really marvellous way. So thank you very much for sharing that. And we will be back with a letter in just a moment. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, 
and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. How can I help you have a better relationship? There's nothing I like better than talking to some of the world's top sex and relationship experts. It helps me learn and grow. And that's why I started this podcast. But what makes my life meaningful is writing and teaching. That's why I've written 20 books on relationships, which have been translated into 20 languages. They fall into two categories. Firstly, improve your relationships. In this category, I'd like to recommend Happy Couple Handbook, powerful love hacks for a successful relationship. I cover constructive arguing, be a better listener, use carrots rather than sticks, and how to forgive and move on. In the second category, which is called Rescue Your Relationship, I have books like I Love You But I'm Not In Love With You, my international bestseller, Can We Start Again? 50 Questions to Fall Back In Love, My Wife Doesn't Love Me Anymore, and My Husband Doesn't Love Me Anymore and He's Texting Someone Else. You can find out more about these books along with details about how to get involved with the show and send in your question to be discussed with my guests at my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com. One of the ways of getting involved with the program is you can become a supporter of The Meaningful Life and uh, you can find details about that and all the bonus material you get with each edition by going to our website www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast where you'll find out how to be a Patreon supporter. Also there you'll find a form that you can fill in to send a letter to us and I will find somebody suitable to discuss it with. And this is the one I'm going to discuss with Juliet. I grew up not feeling I was ever good enough, so I always tried to earn my parents, friends, love and acceptance. Lo and behold, as I'm going through counselling now, I've come to learn that it has been shame that has been eating away at me slowly but surely. All of this shame has manifested in the second event, my partner's affair. It was as if all my childhood shame was exposed at once and I felt rejected again, a victim. It was all my fault and I simply wasn't good enough because my partner cheated on me and fell in love with someone else. Unconsciously, I suppose, I tried everything to block my own shame. I looked for strategies to win them back. I tried being perfect and I tried competing. All of this made me feel worse about myself and none of these activities ever worked. I'm still separated. On top of all of this, my partner's shame is there too, so it's a perfect storm of shame. My partner won't openly address their shame, and I'm not sure what I can do about that, so I just focus on me. How do I balance protecting myself but still being open and vulnerable enough to keep the lines of communication open? So, I think we might have a couple that might be on their way to a bit of self-differentiation here, but it's a very painful place to be in. Any thoughts, Juliet? Yeah, it is very painful. And one of the things that I notice is that the person who wrote the letter is taking responsibility for the affair. And I wonder about that. She or he isn't the one who's crossed the line. The partner has crossed the line. And I'm assuming that they had a contract of monogamy between the two of them. And the honourable thing would have been for the partner to have said, I'm not happy about X, Y, Z. I'm leaving the relationship because I want to have a relationship with someone else before they got to the point of having the affair. So that would have been the way to do this, if you like, with integrity. And the person who's written the letter isn't responsible for their partner's behavior. It is possible that some of the things in the relationship have caused someone to wander, but that's not necessarily true. And there's a very interesting thing that happens when people are having an affair in terms of the power dynamics, because the one having the affair often gets a big boost to their self-esteem because they've been chosen by someone else and they often feel powerful and they often feel wanted. Many of us want to be wanted, but they may also simultaneously be feeling guilt or shame at having broken the agreement with their partner. And then there's the betrayed person who, like this person who's written the letter, may feel a diminished and take the affair personally, but they then have the moral high ground because they haven't broken the contract between the two of them. So it's a very interesting 
power shifts and dynamics. And, and she talks about the shame that the partner feels, or she or he talks about the shame that the partner feels as well. And as I said, shame is the rupture of the interpersonal bridge. That's the definition by Gershon Kaufman. Brene Brown also writes about shame, and she says, shame is an incredibly painful feeling or experience of believing we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. An incredibly painful feeling or experience of believing we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. And I think that's where the work is for this person, is how can they do some work on their family of origin that takes them to a place where they no longer feel unworthy? Because shame is, I am wrong. Guilt is, I did something wrong. Shame is, I am wrong. I am bad. So what would some work on the childhood issues look like? Well, I think starting to talk to yourself in a different way. So a counter-shaming statement is, I matter. And another counter-shaming statement is, I am enough. So sort of abundance and connection. And it may be, I am enough and I matter despite my imperfections, you know, despite the fact that I failed to do this in the marriage or despite the fact that I didn't speak up enough or whatever, I matter and I am enough. The way I would work with this is I have a methodology that I just absolutely love. I find it very powerful called the Peso Boyden system of psychotherapy. And it's a body-based therapy that we do in a group. And for a client like this, we would, with her permission and with her choosing it, We would enroll, she would choose people to represent an ideal mother and an ideal father, the family of origin that she needed, not the family of origin that she got, who would love her in the way that she needed to be loved, who would appreciate her, who would give her a feeling of being valued. Bessel van der Kolk writes about this in his book, The Body Keeps the Score. And what he says, I'm going to quote him here, he says, the healing tableaus of structures and that's what the session is called, it's called the structure. The healing tableaus of structure offer an experience that many participants have never believed was possible for them. To be welcomed into a world where people delight in you, protect you, meet your needs, and make you feel at home. So Bessel van der Kolk is an expert in trauma. And one of the things he said is recently on a video I have is, Pesso Boyden is the only thing that really works. Now, I don't really think he thinks it's the only thing that really works, but it's a profound thing that really works. And that's what he actually said. It's the only thing that really works because we can recreate that childhood experience, giving someone what they needed. And because humans have the ability to be in the here and now and the there and then at the same time, so they can be in their adult self whilst remembering a childhood experience. And so they have a real live experience now and they put it back in their long-term memory as if they'd had that when they were a child. And it's life-changing. It really makes a difference in people's lives. And her final question was, how do I balance protecting myself but still being open and vulnerable enough to be in relation with her or his partner? Well, One question I have is, does she want to go back into this relationship and kind of the wisdom of that or not? There's an issue of trust. Sometimes when people have an affair, it's the thing that really blows the relationship up and then it settles back into a much healthier relationship because everything gets talked through and discussed and can be worked through in a very, very good way. So sometimes it's the absolute thing that bonds the relationship in a way that it's never been bonded before. And other times it puts a crack in the container of the relationship that can never be properly healed. And the trust has gone and it's never properly brought back in. So I would ask her to, or him to get up into their best self and really check why do they want to go back into this relationship? Is it because it's better than nothing? Is it because it's the person they want to be with? Or is it because they don't want the other person to have them? Yes, yes, there's that. And the fact that the question is being asked about, you know, how can I be open and vulnerable and protect myself? I think it's a really lovely question to be asking and shows a lot of self-awareness. And that awareness brings choice. So don't take more than your fair share of the responsibility for what went wrong. And, you know, working on the shame and the self-compassion, I am enough, I matter, those kinds of things. It's easier said than done. You know, it's long-term, deep work, but just being kind to yourself. 
But I think actually asking that question to yourself over and over again, on this occasion, am I getting the balance right between protecting myself and being open? So you're actually living with this question all the time would be a really beautiful way to live. And you'd most probably be able to navigate it through. If you're thinking of it as one big decision, then it's almost impossible to decide. But, you know, he wants to come round or she wants to come round on Wednesday evening. You know, am, am I going to be protecting myself or am I going to be opening up? You can sort of answer that sort of thing. If you know that on Wednesday they want to come round and have a go at you, then probably the answer is no. But, you know, if it's a fairly neutral sort of kind of request, then possibly the answer is yes. So using that question on a daily basis, I think, would be really beautiful. I, I, I hope agree. that's helped. Yeah, no, I agree. And self-compassion. Go and find out and read about self-compassion and bring that more into your life if you can, because that's an antidote to shame. So we're coming to the end of the main program. So I have to ask you as a witness on The Meaningful Life, what makes your life meaningful? The core for me, and I was very lucky, I identified this in my early 30s, the core for me is to help people connect to their inner selves, to their deepest, truest self. And of course, the reason why I wanted to do that is because I needed to connect to my own inner self. <laughs> and and the connection wasn't as strong as it could have been. And I now realize that's because of the shame that was there. My Twitter handle is helping you be you. And I think that's the essence of what's important to me. I also needed to connect back into my body, having had trauma in my childhood. So I went and learned how to horse ride and became a riding teacher and set up a riding school. You know, I did the most body-based thing I could kind of think of in order to reconnect to my physical body which was really helpful, but helping people to connect to their souls, to their deepest desires, to their true self, that's, that's what makes my life meaningful. And I'm very lucky that I get to do that in my work on a regular basis. Well, unfortunately, this is all we've got time for in the main programme. Juliet and I, I think, could probably talk for the next three years. <laughs> we haven't got three years, but we have got some time in the bonus uh, material. And I thought a really good topic for us to discuss is how to deal with guilt, because often we feel guilty. And that is what makes us cooperate with our partner when maybe we don't want to. So we're going to talk about how to deal with guilt. If you want to hear the bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. We're also available on Amazon Music. If you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.